Thank you so much uh, for um, the opportunity to have this conversation. It's a pleasure for me. It's an honor for us. Uh, yes. I am, um, given that we don't have this kind of opportunity all the time, I'd like to just start by asking you, looking back, as far back as you choose to look, what are those key things that stand out for you, whether they're positive or whether they're negative, about Nigeria? Well, you know, um, I have also been very fortunate in that whenever I have tried something uh, to, be, to the best of my belief, on the whole, it has worked. So I can say that my experience has been positive. So if I look back, yes, the first thing when I came out of university was that we were not yet independent as a country. So we were working with British expatriates. And in those days, we had to do what we were told, so to speak. But because we were going towards independence, um, it, it was our responsibility to see how we could measure up to the new status. The measuring to the new status meant that we had to think, is this the right way to do this? Is this what we should be doing? Can we do it better? <coughs> so the first challenge was that we had to take responsibility and become autonomous in our own thinking. Mm. And the atmosphere then was not very friendly. But anyway, the point was that Fortunately for us, we thought, look, if I can do this, why don't I do it? So when I look back, three things are missing, three. The first is, I'm not sure that people now, especially the youngsters, are taking initiatives based on their capacity. Look, I came out of university with a bachelor's degree. Today, there are youngsters who have multiple degrees. And I say, what are they doing with these things? How are they impacting the situation? Because in our own time, we had to take initiatives and sometimes even stand in opposition to. So that's the first thing I'm missing. Second thing I'm missing is that at that time, we felt that if there was something that we knew to be the truth, that's what we should try to do. No matter what anybody else was doing, let us stand on the truth. And the truth may not be comfortable, but if it's the truth, that's the thing you should do. Now, the third thing I'm missing, of course, is that those who were leading the society at the time, those who were leading the country, appeared to be doing so because they had an interest for the country. In fact, I remember that moving to independence, those who were politicians at the time, politicians, a few of them were imprisoned because they tried to express their move towards independence. But they did it not because they had anything to gain themselves, but because they thought that's the way the country ought to go. I'm missing that now. I get the feeling that the politicians of today think of themselves first, and maybe the country later. So that's, that's my comparison. Thank you, sir. And what do you think happened? How did we then go? from your time when leaders think first of the nation and very little of themselves? How do we, did we then get to uh, the point where politicians maybe then talked more of themselves than of the nation? Yes. Again, you know, it's difficult to tell how we went because it was not a sudden transition. And it was not something that you would say people did deliberately. 
But you see, the moment you take self-interest and put it ahead of other interest, then you are liable, you become likely to go in the wrong direction. Because, you see, my philosophy is that if the country or the society is good, is healthy, is doing well, those who will do well will find their place. Mm. But if the society is not doing well, those who want to do well will have a problem. So first put the interest of the country, the people, ahead of any other interest, and you will find that you can also fulfill self-interest when you've taken care of that interest first. So if, in my view, it's because we allowed self-interest to begin to take priority. That's why we found ourselves where we are. You know, sir, I, I'd like for us to just remise a bit. Talk to us about university days. Talk to us about the excitement of looking forward to independence. Talk to us about days of first broadcasting house in the whole of Africa. Those days when we were almost unstoppable. No, you see, the thing is that when I was a young person, not many people went to university. So going to university was something special. And because it was something special, there was an expectation that if you have become part of this special group, you must deliver something. So the, the thought in our minds was we have a responsibility. There is an expectation. And only if we measured up to that expectation could we justify. Because going to a university was not cheap either. And if you went on scholarship or whatever it was, somebody was paying the fees. So try to do your best to meet the expectation. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that the way we were taught was that, you know, if, if there is a need, it is your responsibility with all this education to identify the need, mm. to say, this is what this situation needs. Your second responsibility is to say, this is how this need should be met, okay? But that's the third responsibility. Is there something I can do mm. to meet that need? So three, need, three things, identify the need, find the solution to the problem, but identify what you can do to contribute to the solution. On Independence Day, what were you doing? What did you look forward to? On Independence Day, you'll be surprised. I was a new, new controller Western region of the NBC. I became controller of the NBC in the Western region on the 13th of September just before Independence. Independence Day. So again, there was excitement that we were going into a new status. But here was a new controller, new leader of young people going into independence, and we felt, look, we can see the beginning, but we cannot tell how far this will go. And therefore, there was an excitement, there was a feeling that you had something to give, and you must give it. Yeah. Interesting. And you must give. Leadership is something that you have worked on for a very long time. Ended up at the Lagos Business School from Atlantic University um, to continue to work on leadership. What for you? are key elements. Yes, 
Leadership, leadership is something that we have to think about if we're really going to understand it. Why does anyone become a leader? It is because there are people to be led. If there were not people to be led, there would be no leader. Now, it's important that a leader should not call himself a ruler, a governor, anything like that. You're a leader. Because if you're leading people, then it means that there is a group of people attempting to go together. You are in front. Yes. But you are not a leader unless those people are behind you. So that's the first thing. A leader must have followers. The second thing is that there must be somewhere you are all going. Mm. Some reason you are all moving in this direction. Now, you're going in that direction. You as the leader are going. But the fact that these people are following you means that they also think that's the way to go. Not only that they think that's the way to go, they believe that you as the leader are fit to lead them to where they want to go. Okay? Yes. They want to go somewhere. You must never forget that what the people want to do is key to what the leader is going to do. Because if the people don't want to go there, you cannot lead them there. You will find that there's tension and there's dissension all the time. So the leader has followers. The leader and his followers have objectives. And therefore, the effort that they make to get to that objective must be that both the leader and the followers are making an effort that has the same, the same aim. Now, therefore, this thing between leader and follower is key mm -hmm. to leadership. And any leader who believes that he can lead and the people have to follow is making a mistake. Because if the people don't want to go there, they'll find a way mm. of leaving you on your own and doing what they want to do. So that's the first thing. Now, if that is the situation, then it implies that the leader cannot do whatever they want to go and do by himself. He has those followers because he needs their effort as well. So the leader is not a lone ranger. He's a leader of people. Therefore, he must think of those people. What are their own interests? Can they go at the speed mm. at which I want to go? And if their speed is not like mine, I must tailor my speed to accommodate them. This thing between leader and follower is key to leadership. And therefore, uh, when the leader and his team are going in the right direction, very good. So first, what is the objective? And we all have the same objective. Second, are we a team? And am I really leading a team? But thirdly, Every individual on that team is a person and has, if you like, his own or her own concerns, priorities, and so on. Now, how can you tailor all of that to still go towards achievement that will fulfill the hopes and ambitions of everybody? So the responsibility of the leader is huge in that first he must know what the objective is and be able to convince other people that that is the right objective. Second, he, he must show leadership capacity that makes them believe that he can, he can lead them. But thirdly, he must involve them so that if they have their own views about how they're going, 
he's not ignoring those views. I can tell you one story that illustrated that for me. When I was running a company, our company was producing uh, consumer goods. And we had distributors all around the country who were the agents too. Now, we had a sales manager in ABBA. And ABBA was a good trading place. But most people wanted to receive the goods on credit, sell them, and then pay. Now, if you're running a commercial company, that's not exactly what you want to see happen. But if that is the culture of the people, you've got to think about it. So we on the board had a meeting and said, look, selling these goods on credit is not good commercial sense. So any distributor that wants goods should pay ahead of time and take the goods away. Now, our sales manager in ABBA, knowing that the board had taken this decision, got in touch with us, members of the board, and said, if you choose to do that, you will not do a lot of business. Mm. Because the culture here is that people take things on credit. So what you have to do is to manage mm. the culture. Now, in pure management terms, we had taken a policy decision as a board. Therefore, anybody working for us should just go with policy. But when he sent this message, we looked at it again. We said, what is the real objective? We want to do good business. And if the way to do good business requires that we should manipulate policy a little, let's see if it works. Mm -hmm. But the thing here was, do we trust this sales manager to do the right thing? Do we trust everybody involved, including distributors, to pay when they should and so on? If you can manage it such that you establish the truth in those relationships, it will work. But when this message came to us as a board, it was a learning point. Mm. We now had to learn that if you could not do what the market wanted you to do, you might not be able to succeed in business. It was a learning point. Mm. So we had to be learning leaders. Mm. So just to tell you that story, a leader is not an authority that cannot be educated. And a leader must be ready to take everything and go to the objective that they have in mind. Lately, someone shared with me a very rigorous process that a country, Singapore, goes through uh, for leadership selection. And I wanted to just ask you how vital and how critical and are there examples? I know what you're talking about exactly. Well, they actually spent four years yes. looking at this individual for this leadership. Yes. Now, because of all the things I've said, the person of the leader and the temperament of the leader, these things are key to performance. Because if the leader is not the right kind of person. If the leader comes and thinks, I'm ruling, I'm governing, so do what I do, or does not have a good understanding of people, it can fail. Therefore, to select somebody who is going to be the leader becomes very, very critical. Because you have to test all these things and the best way to test is not to ask questions. If you come to this situation, what will you do? The best way to test is to see what this person has done before. How has this person 
behaved before? How has he performed before? And therefore, has he shown the, the characteristics of somebody that can be led into another role? Because you know, one of the things we forget is that when you take somebody and you say, I want you to be a leader, you are leading them to a new, a different responsibility. Now, the best way to do that is to prepare them for it, mm -hmm. to make sure that they are ready for it. How can you be sure that they're ready for it if you don't make an effort to get them ready? And you know, we do it every day in business. Mm -hmm. When you want to appoint a senior manager, you want to do this, you send them to training. You make sure you ex exchange with them information mm -hmm. that improves the level they used to be. All right? And we do all of that until we come to national leadership. When we come to national leadership, you don't do any training. You don't uh, require any, you don't even require evidence of good performance at lower levels. Now, you, you cannot, that the Singapore story tells you that these people said they must see evidence that this person has done this, has done this at this level, at that level, at that level, and therefore is capable of going to a new level. And if you, if you, if you don't do that, the point is that you should not be surprised if leadership fails. Yeah. What else, uh, apart from what you have said now, do you think can be um, attributable for leadership failure across Africa? Well, look, leadership failure anywhere. Or anywhere, sir. Anywhere is sure to happen if the conditions for good performance have not been put down. To begin with, we must remember that leadership is a responsibility. It is not just uh, title, status, uh, paraphernalia, no. Leadership is something you have to do, it's a responsibility. If there's a responsibility, you have to know that responsibility. And how do you know a responsibility unless you have learned it? Because we're not, we, we're not leaders by nature. We're leaders, we develop into leaders. How do you develop? So you, you have capacity. As I said, as young men, we said, this is what we can do. But if you're going to take leadership, then you have to learn what is involved. Learning is important. And learning means you have to have humility. You have to be humble enough to know that there is something that I need to learn. Something I need to know, I don't yet know it, but I need to learn it. And sometimes you're going to have to learn it from somebody maybe who is even junior to you because like I said about the sales manager, we learned something from that sales manager, even with the hierarchy, he was far down. So learning. But thirdly, thirdly, you see, unless the leader, the person who has now become leader, is determined to perform as a leader, to perform, because you've been put there to do something, not just to ride about in cars and to, uh, you know, flaunt yourself around. No, no, no. There is something you are required to do. So what am I required to do? Until I perform, I'm not justifying my position as leader. Many of us sometimes look at leadership as something you, are, you acquire by patronage. It is not patronage. It is performance. If you have not shown that you can do something, you have no right to be made a leader. Interesting. 
how, how did all of this and your um, perception of who a good leader is shape the work you did at the Nigerian High Commission in the United Kingdom? There's all right. a lot that's been said about what you did in terms of revolutionizing the place. Well, you talk about the Nigeria High Commission. First of all, uh, the appointment to the High Commissioner post was based on the fact that I had other experience before. And my acceptance of that position was based on the fact that I knew I had done some things before I had done national broadcasting. I had done a commercial company. So I knew that there were things that I had already done that I could uh, gain from in doing this. But finally, finally, to become high commissioner, I was no longer MD or chairman or anything. I was now high commissioner. What am I here to do? What service am I here to deliver? And when I got there and discovered that there were some misunderstandings about what a person in that position should do, uh, I tried to do what, and I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, one day, my principal accounting officer, this was after I became high commissioner, came to me and said that he wanted to tell me something. And I said, what is it? He said, well, you know, I want to tell you that high commissioners don't behave the way you do. And I said, that is very interesting. Uh, well, how exactly? Give me, illustrate for me. And he said, now look, uh, on, on, on a working day, you are here before we get here. You are here throughout the time we are here. When we're going away, you are still here and you are working. No, high commissioners don't do that. High commissioners wait until we're all here, then they come in and so. And I said two things. I said, please, forgive me. I have never been high commissioner before. This is my first experience. And I can only go by what I already know. So. That's my first experience. But what I already know is that in my previous positions, whatever I expected my followers to do, I must do to an exemplary level. So that if I expect, expect them to be punctual to the office, I must come to the office on time. If I expect them to give time to what they're doing and look at standards, I must look at mine. And that, that's what I've been trying to do. So you see, uh, so far, it seems to be working because we seem to be succeeding. My point, my point is this, that a leader should never require his followers or her followers to do something that that leader is not prepared to, not to, just to do, but to do by example. Mm. Because leadership is also example. Because the people following you have a right to expect that if there's something to be done, you will lead the way. You'll show the example. So that's... Between then and now, people have made comparison in terms of Nigeria's diplomatic standing and our approach to diplomacy. What do you think has changed? Now, let me say right away that I do not uh, indulge in comparing what people are doing now with what I did. When I went to be High Commissioner, I met a particular situation and I met particular people. There were needs that Nigeria had at that time. For instance, I can tell you, those were the years of 419, 
when Nigeria's reputation was in the doldrums. So that was the situation we had to deal with. What we did then was our best effort to address the situation we found. Now, what are the situations they're finding today? I don't know. Therefore, it is sometimes unwise for me to say uh, the way they're doing now, because I don't know what they're encountering now. The important thing I, I can say is, whatever are the needs of your situation when you are in charge, make sure that you do your best to meet those needs and to lead in such a manner that the problems arising from those needs are addressed properly. Now, if that is what is happening now, then I can't ask more than that. But as I say, I don't compare. I wanted to just ask you, sir, um, there was a time when it was said that Nigeria used its diplomatic muscle, respect for the country, and use diplomacy to achieve significant economic goals. It appears today that you look around and you're asking yourself, so why do we choose ambassadors in certain places? Why do we have high commissioners or embassies in the same certain place? What is driving this? Is there a major change in terms of what our overarching goals are? As a well, let me try to address this by doing a comparison, not just with the diplomatic aspect of life, but with the performance of Nigeria, because the diplomat is representing Nigeria. There was a time that many African countries were not independent. And so one by one, they became independent. And at that time, the habit was that if a country was going to be independent, they, looked, they came to Nigeria to say, look, we want to set up our judiciary. We want to set up our civil service. We have seen the way you're doing things. Please, can you help us? So we had Nigerians who went, we had a Nigerian lawyer who went to be chief, chief justice, justice in Zimbabwe, and so on and so forth. So that was the situation then. And that was the height of respect that Nigeria, by performance, mm. had attained. OK? Mm. Now, in fact, there was a time that the reputation was that our civil service was one of the best in the Commonwealth. All right? And these things are not rumors. They were fact. So what has happened? What has happened is that is what I've been trying to say, that we have allowed self-interest to become so dominant that we're no longer looking at the interest of the nation and the capacity of the nation. As we talk today, this nation still has people that can do great things. Let me remind you that there was a time that we had a Nigerian Secretary General of the Commonwealth, of the Commonwealth. He was in that position for 10 years. 10 years. It was supposed to be five years. They renewed it. And he did so well. In fact, during his tenure, Nigeria's behavior was so bad that they suspended us. But all of these things added up. The fact that Nigeria could behave in such a manner that it earned suspension was one of the declining uh, uh, events that led us to where we are. So you see, it's not just diplomatic life. It is that the respect we've had as a nation has declined. And now, if people want somebody to come and help them, do they come to ask us? No. So it has changed. And 
we cannot blame anybody. We can't, we can't attribute it to anybody else. It's to ourselves. Hmm. I, I had a conversation with uh, a diplomat uh, who said he served in a number of uh, positions in Africa before he <clears throat> then served in the States. How ministers in African countries will come to him and his colleagues elsewhere to say, oh, we have someone who's ill. Can you give us a recommendation to the University um, College Hospital in Iran? Um, as just to corroborate the point that you are making in terms of performance. Because you make the point, our ranking was as a result of performance. Yes. So does it mean that all that has happened is that we just lost it. Um, you see, it is, it is a natural process. When you are, when you are concentrating on performing well, your person, you yourself, become a secondary consideration. It is that performance. You are asking people to judge the performance and to make their minds up. Is this performance satisfactory? Is it helping you or not? Now, if that's the way you are, and particularly if a succession of Nigerians go into that position and produce the same level of performance, then it becomes a respect for Nigeria. Mm. This is how we can rely on Nigerians to behave. But the moment that we lose that focus, the moment that instead of concentrating on the quality of what we are producing, we are now saying, you know, uh, this is my right and this is what I must do, we lose it. Because now we're no longer focusing on the performance. So that's what has happened. And you see, if we're going to tell the truth to ourselves, and this is something we find very difficult, if we're going to tell the truth to ourselves, we have to confess that the way we used to behave is different from the way we behave now as a nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How do we, sir, I mean, just now addressing the youths of the country, how do you, um, even with my children, have difficulty? when I tell them about the Nigeria that I knew, and that is much earlier, I mean, later than your own time. I said, so that, that cannot, couldn't have happened. How do we assure the youths of today? Okay, let me. Once, there was once in Nigeria of enviable status that we can- There's, a, still there's a question, there's a question that perhaps we ought to be asking ourselves, that we're not asking ourselves. In today's Nigeria, can we find anybody, particularly any young person, who in spite of what is happening is still doing the right thing? Mm. Can we find a young person who says, although this is the way society is going, I am not going to go that way. This is what I think is right and I'm going to do what is right. Yes, there are such people. Yeah. Now, question. Are those the people we talk about today? Mm. Do they have any publicity? The, if you ask a school child today, who are the people doing good things in this country? The names you will hear are names that will disgust you. And yet, there are young people who are, without waiting for government, without waiting for sponsors, are saying, this is the thing to do, and I am going to do it. Now, those are the people we need to be building up and to say, this thing you're doing, let's support you. Let us see what we can do to 
bring it into prominence. Because you know, I have a personal philosophy, which you don't mind if I share now. It is difficult for you to meet a human being, normal human being, who wants to be identified as a bad person. Most people you meet actually want you to have a good opinion of them. And the best way for other people to have a good, a good opinion of you is to do well. Yeah. So our natural inclination is to do well so that we can earn the good opinion of other people. All right? But, but if we do well and we don't earn that good opinion, then we say it's not, there's no point doing well. That's what has happened to us. The people who are publicized in this country today are the ones who are doing whatever it takes to succeed. In their own way. In their own way. Whereas the people who are doing well and who are trying to do the best thing, you don't hear about them. Huh? You don't even, the ones who are doing good work have to go on the streets to try to earn the right pay. Huh? The doctors, the teachers who are trying to do good work have to go on strike to get paid properly. And yet, do you know what assembly people are carrying home every day? It's, look, these things are fact. They are not imagination. So if instead of putting our investment where our fortunes lie, we prefer to put our investment where, you know, it's expedient, mm. don't be surprised mm. that we fail. Let me, let me begin to bring this to a close. I want to just ask you um, two questions I will ask you. First, I want to talk about education and what you think we can do. Uh, because I think in all of this, education is important. Yes. Um, and then, of course, the other question that I'll end with would be to ask you what message you have for uh, youths. Fortunately for me, I have been active in education part of my life. I was a secondary school teacher. That's how I started work. But I also went, to t went on to teach at university level. And I know, I know that when you face students and you show them the right thing to do, students will agree with you that yes, what you are saying is right. This is the right thing to do. Then they will say, but look at what is happening. Mm. If you do this in this place, you will not succeed. Mm. So that's the first thing. So education, there is nothing wrong with education. Mm. If only we get the right people to do it. The thing is that when you get educated and you now want to impact the society with the results of your education. When you come out of university, the university certificate that you are given, they actually say that this man has satisfied the authorities of education in both what? Character and learning. Character and learning. Does anybody want to know your character? So if they are not looking at your character, why do you go to that length to get it? So you see, let's stop blaming education. What we should do is to say, if you actually educate somebody and say you are now worthy in character and learning, let that person have the, the joy of knowing that both character and learning are effective outside. So my final question would be, what message do you have to uh, leaders, 
and to the young? At this stage of my life, the main two things that I want to emphasize are first, that I believe that every individual has the capacity to make a contribution, to do something. It may not be very huge, may not, may not be very impressive, but you have been given the capacity to do something. Now, if anybody, especially the young people of today, cannot point to something they are doing to make their situation better, they're failing. So look at yourself, what can you do? Do it. It may not earn the rewards that you're looking for, but do it all the same. That's number one. Number two is about leadership. Now, I believe that Nigeria has had good leadership in the past. We have had Nigerians who led well, especially, especially, we have had Nigerians who led well internationally. We've had DG of World Trade Organization. We've had Executive Secretary of Commonwealth. We've had uh, President of International Court of Justice. These were Nigerians. If they could do these things away from here, it shows that they have the capacity to do them here. But it also shows that there must be other Nigerians who are able to do what they are doing. But the situation here seems to be uh, somewhat unfriendly. I don't want to use hostile. Somewhat unfriendly to people who just want to do well because they are capable of doing well. They do well, what do they get for it? So, but if the people we are pointing to leadership will only do three things, three things. One, what are the real needs of the country that they want to help us to address? The leadership is not about them, it's about the country. What are our real needs? Two, are they ready? Have they brought themselves up to the point where they can actually perform to meet those needs. But three, when they get into office, it is not by building a mansion to live in that you show that you're a leader. Rather, it is by what you do for the nation. That is what shows leadership. Let leaders concentrate on leading people to work for the nation rather than for themselves. Thank you so very much. Such a pleasure spending as much time as we have. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You, Thank, and, you, uh, Thank you, sir. Good. Thank you, sir.